for uh, being patient and reconnecting and everything. Let's toss it over to Keisha to get us started. Uniki suck everyone. Natasa Wiskini Milasha, new to Maasakwinahanit. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Keisha. I'm an enrolled member of the Wampanoag tribe of Gay Hedaquina and also Oglala Lakota. Um, I offer my respects to the land and the ancestors whose spirits still walk among us. Welcome to the Indigenous Liberation Speaker Series webinar for April 2022. This is a monthly webinar series presented by United American Indians of New England and the North American Indian Center of Boston. We appreciate the generous donors who have made this year's webinar series possible. All of the programs we are doing this year are online and available to watch on the UAN YouTube channel. Um, United American Indians of New England uh, is one of the oldest uh, Native American civil rights groups in the Massachusetts area. Uh, we are best known for organizing uh, National Day of Mourning protests. You can see it behind Jean-Luc. Um, we also lead the Indigenous People's Day efforts here in Massachusetts, um, and we're currently working to pass Indigenous-centered bills through the um, Massachusetts Indigenous Agenda. Um, this month's topic is Indigenous climate resistance. Earth Day is celebrated this month, but of course Earth Day is every day for Indigenous people who care for the land and water and are on the front lines dealing with extraction and destructive impacts of climate change. As Indigenous people, we have been experiencing violence against the land, water, and our bodies for many generations. On today's webinar, we will have some frontline defenders who have important messages to share. We also want to name the fact that systems including settler colonialism, white supremacy, patriarchy, and capitalism have put profits before the earth and encouraged violence against all life. The climate solutions that are proposed too often fail to consider that we cannot turn to the same systems that created climate change to fix everything. Our organization joins others that have critiqued half steps, such as the Green New Deal, that will create more destruction of native homelands, has largely excluded Indigenous perspectives and does not address the need for the return of Indigenous lands. UAN uh, stands in solidarity with the, new, the Red New Deal as put forward by the Red Nation, and we'll be kicking off tonight's program with an overview of the Red New Deal from Justine Tiba. Before I turn it over to Jean-Luc, uh, we wanted to let everyone know that hundreds of people are still facing criminal charges and looming court dates for the actions they took to resist construction of Line 3 in Minnesota. Please donate to their legal defense fund if you can via line3legalfund.com. So I'm going to hand it over to Jean-Luc now. Thank you, uh, Keisha. Thank you to everyone for, for being patient and, and, um, and logging back in. Thank you so much. Uh, North American um, Indian Center Boston joins with United American Indians of New England um, on this Indi Indigenous Liberation Speaker Series. Uh, NACOB, uh, we are on the traditional Indigenous territory of the Massachusetts Nation, uh, who continue to this day in part through their lineal descendants, the Massachusetts tribe of Ponkapog. Um, and in acknowledging the land that we're on as an organization, we are making agreements with our hosts. Um, one such agreement, of course, is the uh, to support every effort by our host tribes to rematriate uh, land and natural resources back to the original peoples. Uh, NACOB is the um, oldest urban Indian center in uh, Massachusetts. We uh, provide cultural and social services uh, for the New England Native American community uh, for now over uh, 50 years. Uh, my name is Jean-Luc Perit. I am a member of the Tunica Biloxi tribe of Louisiana. Uh, although you do see the National Day of Mourning behind me, uh, I'm actually uh, calling in remotely from uh, my own home territory in central, uh, so-called central Louisiana, um, close to our, our tribal lands uh, outside of Marksville, uh, Louisiana. Uh, so happy to, happy to be here with everybody today. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, kick off our, uh, our presentations. We're going to have uh, four speakers, uh, and then we'll open it up for a Q&A uh, afterwards. Uh, first, we're going to have uh, Justine uh, Tiba. Uh, Justine is from uh, Santa Clara and uh, Tesca uh, Pueblos, and is an organizer for the Red Nation in Tiwa Territory in Albuquerque, New Mexico.
Uh, the Red Nation is a coalition of uh, Native and non-Native activists, educators, students, and community organizers advocating for Native liberation. The coalition formed to address the marginalization and invisibility of Native struggles within mainstream social justice organizing and to foreground and uh, the targeted destruction and violence towards Native life and land. So uh, Justine, welcome and the floor is yours. Thank y'all for having me here. It's an honor. Ubiak in the Navitela Kama Kop Bovi, Navi Medicana Kama Justin Tiba, Tetuga Winga, Kapo Winga, Hera Haku, Iwedi Omu. Good evening, everybody. My name is Justine Tiba. I am from the Pueblos of Santa Clara, Tesuki, and Akama. I am based in Akama Pueblo, but right now I am joining you from the Red Nation's office um, in. Uh, occupied Tiwa territory, uh, aka the settlement of Albuquerque, New Mexico. And I am in the Larry Cassis Freedom Center, where uh, the Red Deal was actually brought together. Um, so uh, thank you for introducing the Red Nation. We have been a group, activist group since 2014. We arose to combat border town violence, which is the specific form of violence that exists in the border towns uh, right outside of reservations. So um, any, any town where indigenous people are going to live their lives, to get their resources, that would be considered a border town and can be in which is basically every town, all the settlements. And so um, we arose to combat border town violence, to stand up for our relatives. And uh, through that work, we, um, we sort of, uh, for, through that work, we brought forth the Red Deal. Um, and real quickly, I'll also introduce Red Media, which is an offshoot of the Red Nation. It is a media, um, outlets. We do podcasts, the Red Nation podcast, Red Power Hour, Bands of Turtle Island. Uh, we do YouTube videos on the Red Nation YouTube, and we publish books. Um, that would be the Red Deal, and we have other books on the way. Um, so to get into the Red Deal, um, but the Red Deal was written by community members from all over New Mexico and beyond. We uh, gathered, we created a coalition of all these organizations and we all crammed into our office here at the Larry Cassis Freedom Center where we um, identified areas of struggle that we organize um, toward, you know, so uh, we're talking about like MMIW, um, health, free healthcare, you know, just, just all of these different things we started uh, listing and talking about and identifying. And then from there, we uh, started doing research on all of these things. And from those research, from that research, we put out these PDFs called the Red Deal Part 1, 2, and 3. And the book is divided up into um, three parts, but really four sections. Um, we begin the book by sort of talking about, well, we begin the book by uh, talking about different things. We talk about resistance, new deals, decolonization, anti-imperialism, the Red Deal, a caretaking economy, demilitarization, land back. Um, it's not just an Indian problem. And the four principles of the Red Deal, which I'm going to go into now. Um, so um what creates crisis cannot solve it this is the first principle of the red deal and in that section we go into um so we go into divestments and we're talking about how um what creates crisis cannot solve it so an example of that would be here in new mexico how we are relying you know everybody's um boasting about free tuition but where does that free tuition money come from it comes from fracking it comes from um the excavation of our sacred lands so we're saying that you know you can't have free education that's coming from these um from from the settler occupation and so we're talking about demilitarization in this section and how um and how we can divest from that as a from the military and reinvest into things like education. With the, UN, the United States spends um, the, the majority of its budget on the United States military and US imperialism. Um, 
Oh, man. I want to read a, a, a one-liner that we quote a lot from this section. Oh, here it is. Imagine if the U.S. military had to hold a bake sale to keep its door open while giving life and sustaining programs were fully, while life sustaining programs were fully funded and never in fear of disappearing. So imagine if uh, instead that uh, it was the US military who had to hold a bake sale to find their funding for the next bomb instead of school children holding a bake sale for their own education. Imagine a world like that. Uh, our second principle of the Red Deal is change from below and to the left. And um, basically what we're saying about that is we're talking about people power. People power is the most direct form of democracy. And we're specifically talking about a leftist movement uh, to create the change, to create this mass movement. Um, our third principle is politicians can't do what only mass movements can do. In this section, we talk about how politicians are geared um, geared towards uh, reform and how they have to be, um, I guess, loyal to their parties or whatever. Even, um, even I, and I, I'm sorry to say this, but even Deb Holland just recently uh, went back on her promises to, um, to end fracking and, and is now supporting more extraction. So, you know, it's, Deb Holland is loyal to the Democratic Party, and we're only going to achieve what we want through uh, mass movements and people power. And for uh, that's going to be from theory to action. And basically what we're saying in this section is that um, Okay, I'll just actually read this part right here. We must not turn away from the truth. We do not yet possess the ca capacity for revolution. Otherwise, we ha would have seen a unified mass movement come out of the remarkable revolutionary energy of the past decade. And we're talking about pa the past decades of all these uh, movements that arose, including the No Dapple movement. And yet we have very little time to get there. This is the contradiction and duty of our generation, decolonization or extinction. And so from there, uh, we divide up the book into three parts. And that's going to be, uh, di part one is divest and the occupation. Part two is heal our body, reinvest in our common humanity. And part three, heal our planet, reinvest in our common future. So for the first part, I'll go ahead and talk about um, divest and the occupation. And the areas of struggle that we identified um, in this is we uh, want to defund the police, immigration and customs enforcement, cu uh, customs, and border, customs and border protection and child protective services. We want to end border town violence. We want to, we want to abolish incarceration, prisons, juvenile detention facilities, jails, border security. We want to end occupation everywhere and we want to abolish imperial borders. And so we want a full uh, I don't know where the quote is in the book. It's actually really cool. We well, basically, uh, we want to do a full scale assault on capitalism and US imperialism, because through ending those things, we'll, we will create an abundance of resources that takes us into our next sections, which is part two. Um, heal our bodies, reinvest in our common humanity. So the trillions of dollars that we're spending on the US military and US imperialism, we are saying that if we completely defund those institutions and reinvest those into our common humanity, we will be re reinvesting into things like citizenship and equal rights, free and sustainable housing, free and accessible education, free and adequate healthcare, free, reliable and accessible public transportation and infrastructure, non-carceral mental health support, and no more suicides, healthy, sustainable, and abundant food, clean water, land, and air, an end to gender, sexual, and domestic violence, and an end to MMIWR. So um, health-wise, human-wise, these are the things that we would be re reinvesting these trillions of dollars from divestment from occupation into. And that's the human side. The third part would be reinvesting money into our planet, into our heal our planet, reinvest in our common future. And in that section, we're, um, our areas that we're talking about is clean and sustainable energy, traditional and sustainable agriculture, that's land return and land remediation, land, water, air, and 
animal restoration, protection and restoration of sacred sites, the enforcement of treaty rights and other agreements. And so um, in this book, that, uh, so, and that's basically the layout of the Red Deal. Um, you know, it's, it's actually very simple. And the full title of the Red Deal is the Red Deal, Indigenous Action to Save Our Earth. This is a climate crisis action plan through indigenous resistance. Um, and uh, one thing I forgot to mention about the Red Deal is that it's largely based on the, um, it's largely based on the um, uh, MOSS movements, um, uh, people, the People's Agreement. Uh, and so the Mo MOSS is uh, the movement towards socialism in Bolivia. And this document, the Red Deal, was largely based on the, um, I'm sorry, the, the process of change. The agreement spells out principles of ecofeminism, eco socialism, and anti imperialism infused with traditional indigenous eco ecological knowledge. This is the spirit of this book, The Red Deal, a manifesto, a movement born of indigenous resistance and decolonial struggle. We have everything to learn from our relatives in the South. And we look to Bolivia to uh, how this could potentially work on a mass scale, how it could potentially work here in the United States. In Bolivia, uh, under Evo Morales, they were able to successfully create, um, able to create a plurinational state, which means that the indigenous tribes in Bolivia all had a seat in their government and had a real stake in how things are done. And, um, and from there, they just implement all of these things where they center indigenous people, like the government can't put anything out without um, communicating to tribes in their own language you know, uh, and, and, and all these other things. What we like to say of the Red Nation is the indigenous Wakanda already exists and it exists in Bolivia. And that's what we look to when we're thinking of what an indigenous future is. And uh, we want to do this all through revolution, through people power, through movement building. And um, let's see. And yeah. Um, that is an overview of the Red Deal. I'm trying to think of like some personal thoughts that I want to tell you about y'all about real quick. I wonder how many, um, let's see, I'm about 10, minute, 10 minutes in, how much, about 10 minutes time left. Okay, all right, thank you. <laughs> so um, I just got back from New York City last week and there I was talking about the red deal as well and we were sort of we had this um really good conversation uh one of the examples that was brought up during that time was um you know we we're in new york city and the brooklyn shooting happened right before we got there i think like two days before we got there and i'm sure you all saw the viral tweets going around that was saying um that this is just the latest example of the failure of um, investing millions and millions of dollars into thousands of police in the New York subways and how it was a complete failure. And that's exactly um, how we see occupation. It's a failure on humanity. It's a failure on, um, on the earth and it's actively like carving and hurting us. Uh, and another example I gave during that talk was when uh, was talking about uh, land remediation and uh, land return in specifically in the Tewa lands where I'm from. So um, an occupier where I'm from in northern New Mexico is the Los Alamos National Labs and um, Los Alamos National Labs began nuclear colonialism by creating the world's most deadly and destructive weapon to ever be made in the history of humankind. Um, that atrocity was made in my sacred mountains. And there is even a cap of how much one can hunt and eat um, animals from those mountains because of nuclear contamination, because we would get sick through those animals. And so if you think about it, um, even if we did get the land back and um, did get the land return of, 
of these uh, sacred areas and, and our traditional homelands, we would still be burdened with having to clean up these lands and having to um, to get rid of all of this nuclear contamination. Um, and so we um, and so we talk about how the United States is actually owes us a climate debt and we're not uh, and but with this climate debt, they owe us um, cleaned land, cleans and remediated lands. They owe it, they owe it to us to invest, divest from occupation and reinvest into the land itself by cleaning it up. And this is uh, for the entire world, everywhere that U.S. military and occupation touches. Um, I know that we are not um, we're not extraordinary in our struggle but we won't be free until we are all free. And so um, another thing to know about the Red Deal is, is that this is an anti-imperialist and global um, project. Something that the Red Deal, not the Red Deal, the Green New Deal is unsuccessful um, in doing. Um, in, in order to save the planet, we have to dismantle US imperialism. Um, but yeah, I'm actually, um, after that overview, I don't think I really have much more to say. I would actually love to hear some questions um, when question time comes around. If anybody wants to know more about the Red Deal, I would say that's just a very basic overview of the Red Deal, and I am out of time. Thank you so much for having me. Looking forward to the rest of the conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Justine. Um, we're going to uh, call up next. Um, uh, from Oglala Lakota, uh, Julie Richards, aka Mama Jules. Uh, Mama Jules is a frontline water protector uh, and land defender and the founder of Mothers Against Meth Alliance. The mission of Mothers Against a Meth Alliance, or MAMA, is to provide competent and compassionate advocacy, community action, media outreach, drug education and provide rehabilitation resources that reflect the traditions and customs of the Lakota, Nakota, Nakota and Dakota people uh, for all those affected by methamphetamine addiction, their families and their communities. Mama Jules educates on the uh, troubling connection between meth addiction, oil extraction, and the epidemic of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. So without, the, uh, without further ado, Mama Ju uh, Jules, uh, welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. Can yeah, you I, yeah, yeah, we can, we, can, we can hear you well. So, uh, the floor is yours, so tell us all about your, uh, all, all about your work. Wow, where do I begin? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I guess I started, it all started with um, my fight against meth when my oldest daughter became addicted. So I've been doing fighting meth. Um, and Mama's is, we're a grassroots program. And so everything we do, like, we don't, we don't get no government grants or tribal. Like, we're just out here on our own, you know, <laughs> trying to fight meth the best way that I, I can or I, that I know how. But um, my fight against meth brought me to the fight against pipelines in the man camp and so um it became a really big big part of my fight because I'm like you know might as well stop the head of you know this black snake it's all coming from these man camps like the drugs the sex trafficking and so I started you know fighting the pipelines I just had my last court case for um line three yesterday so I just got to get through my probation and I'll be done there. <laughs> you know, people say, oh, wow, we were at Standing Rock. And we're like, yeah, but there's been so many more front lines. There are so many more front lines. You know, every community has a front line. Like every community is battling the meth epidemic, fentanyl, morphine, you know, and it's up to us as community members to stand up and say, we're not gonna deal with this. Like we we want a safe community. We want our kids to be able to walk downtown and not have to worry about them getting shot. 
or run over by a drunk driver or picking up a dirty needle, you know? So just like my, like never in a million years have I ever thought that I would be doing the things I did. I started out just educating and bringing awareness my community about the meth epidemic. Sorry, it's kind of chilly out here. I didn't realize it was. I'm up in the mountains, the Appalachians, so the temperature drops quick. But yeah, so I just wanted to like bring awareness and and like I look back. Um, I'm in this documentary called Women of the White Buffalo, and it was filmed like four years ago. And I look when I watch it and look back, and I was like, wow all those goals that like I wanted to do, like the safe building a safe house for the kids. I I want to build a detox. Our our tribe don't have a detox. A lot of tribes don't have detoxes. Last night I had a mother call me from a tribe and her son had been up for like three days and he was hallucinating and she'd been up with him too watching him. And she didn't know what else to do. So she reached out. So I talked with her for a couple hours, you know, and and um, I just told her, you know, what I do with, with my people, with my own kids. And and um, they don't have anywhere to go there. And the only thing that we have on our tribe to help them is to put them in jail. So we're like actually criminalizing our addicts who really need treatment. We don't have any treatment centers for them. We don't have a detox. Like I said, the only place is to put them in jail. We have that ingestion law. South Dakota State Prison is filled up like 70% of the indigenous women there are in there for ingestion because it's a felony in South Dakota. So you get three ingestion charges guess what you're a habitual criminal and they're going to charge you for that because they charge my daughter for that <clears throat> my jacket on and so she she literally turned a two-year sentence into like an eight-year and the last time she in this last time they finally offered her that med treatment and they have a year-long really really good med treatment center there but my problem is, why are you going to wait until they're in prison to offer them that? Shouldn't that come first? And I argued with like the prosecutors and I even mentioned it to the judge. If someone has three ingestion charges, that tells me that they need to be in treatment. That don't tell me they need to be in prison. Like we're just criminalizing them. And so that's why our prisons are filled up. But of course, they get money off of it. So they don't care. You know, the more the more they can lock up, the more money they get. And that's another big connection, you know. Advocating for the addicts, it's it gets really hard because so many people would rather put them down and shut the door on them rather than say, like, like what's going on? Like, how can I help you? Like. You know, there's hope. Don't ever lose hope. I've seen so many people recover from the meth, from, you know, being addicted to meth. I've seen people bounce back, like literally from the street. And so, you know, we have a lot of success stories. But then we get the sex trafficking part that comes with, with, with addiction, with all addiction. You know, and and that's how our girls are miss, go missing. And so, it, you know, I patrol my community. I do my own patrols. I, I started doing that after Emily Bluebird passed away. I got the tip on where she was that morning. I went looking for her by the afternoon. We found her. And everything I do, I always pray about it. You know, I asked Tugashi Law to guide me and, and show me, you know, how I can help my people better. And I just started, you know, so I, I'm going to start patrolling. 
So I did. And, you know, a lot of times we'd pick up little kids walking in the middle of the night, going to Big Bats because it's a 24 hour store. So they go there to get food. So for a minute, I had my little FEMA trailer <laughs> turned into a safe house. Take the kids home. One time I had so many kids there, there was nowhere else to sleep. My son, my son was in his room. <laughs> he had what was one of his little cousins. So I said, lay by John, John. John John woke up in the morning. Whose kid is this? <laughs> but I'm like, you know, they weren't, their house wasn't safe. And my kids understand there, you know, they've been really, really supportive and and you know, they're they have heart for the people too. So it's just all one big connection, you know, fighting for the land, fighting for the water. It's like fighting for our people. And it's up to us as community members to make that change. The council representatives don't care. If they cared, they would have supported us a long time ago. I started going in front of council eight years ago, warning them that if we didn't start doing some about the mess, we were gonna have murders, we're gonna have people going missing, we're gonna have elders being abused, babies being abused. And you know, we've been through all that now. And we're still going through it at least once a week. Like everybody has guns. So it's a whole new ball game now. Right before I came out here, they did drive a drive-by on my house. I didn't even think it was at my house. I thought it was down the road. And we're, it's like the norm. We're so used to it. And, and I thought, it sounds really close. And I had my twin grandbabies. And they were on the floor in their little chairs. And I hit the deck. And then pretty soon the cops, there's the cops out there. And then my youngest daughter came in, like, get in here, somebody's shooting. And she's like, there's cops all over out there. I didn't pay attention here the next morning. We went and on the, I was on the other end of the trailer. Good thing because like it was at the, the um, east end, my trailer had bullet holes in it. <clears throat> and I get that retaliation for just standing up to these dealers. And like letting them know, like, I'm here to protect the people. Like, I don't care who you are. You're poisoning our people. Then you're going to have to deal with the consequences. I did everything. I publicly shamed them. I literally physically fought with them. Like, I always get my windows broke out and my, my tires slashed. And, and you know, it, a couple of times they rushed my house. Good thing I have a big old son who was a state champion wrestler. So he was always protecting me. And and then people are like, well, why don't you get a gun? And, you know, I had a gun before, but like, I also carry a pipe. I don't want to kill my own people either, you know? And and so I got rid of my gun and, and you know, I just, I just have the faith that as long as I continue to fight for the people in the land and the water in a good way, the ancestors are always going to protect me. Like, this is like my ninth, going into my ninth year fighting this. And, like, I, ever since I start patrolling and start picking up those little kids, I said, I want to get a safe house. I don't care if I have to build a little cabin to bring these kids in. Anyway, I just got a piece of land. And I got um, this really awesome group to be my fiscal sponsor. So they're basically gonna like write, basically do a lot of the work for me and like fundraising and and all of that. And um, we're gonna go back and start building. And the first thing I wanna build is like a big house for all the kids. And on the other end of the land, I'd like to build like maybe a, a two person detox to start with. And um, I want to have like some safe houses for like folks who are coming out of treatment. And because a lot of times they come home, they come home to the same thing. 
the addiction, the alcoholism. And so they end up, you know, and there's really nothing to do there. It, there's, there's jobs. You can get a job if you want, but like, it's just people are just so dependent on the government anymore, especially after COVID. They got all that free money and it's like made them dependent. I'm like, you all, you don't need money to rise up. People are like, we want to start a program, but we don't have no money. I'm like, I started this program out of my, my house. I'm still fighting man out of my house. One of the stories I did, the reporters, like, he came and spent a couple of days with me and he was like, wow. He was like, the um, the fight against meth is really at your front door, isn't it? Because <laughs> he's seen everything that, you know, that I go through. So it gets pretty wild, but, you know, the ancestors have been great and been keeping me in their favor. And um, there's a bunch of coal mines out here and they were doing an um, action against one of the coal mines here. So that's why I was coming out here to West Virginia because me and Big Wind on our both of our territories, we have one of the biggest coal mines in like North America. And not only is it poisoning our land and water, it's poisoning the air. It's like a 15 mile stretch of land. And there's signs that say, if you see the orange dust, roll your window up and turn your um your your car to whatever the inside air or whatever, however that works, where it recirculates within your car and it doesn't come from outside. So it has those signs up there. And that's 15 miles from where the Black Hills is. Like 15 miles from Custer. And so all of that comes downriver to us. That's why our water is so contaminated. You know, so I wanted to see how they go about doing things here because, you know, that they've been doing that for so long. I remember and it was just a little bitty thing. And now it's a huge operation where they have those um, long tunnels or whatever above ground that carry it across the road. And so, you know, it's, there's just, there's always a fight for Mother Earth everywhere. Dacker Pass, they've been going at it. Conahus, Tiny House Warriors, Wet'suwet'en. All of them, they've all been throwing down for so long. You know, real warriors. I get bored or I get, I get, you know, I need to take a break from fighting math. I'm like, all right, I'm going to go hit up one of these front lines. You know, there's always somewhere to help. And if you can't help physically, then prayers up. You know, there's always room for prayers on that front line. It's been crazy here. It's like two hours ahead of my time at home. But I was out in California. My sister went missing from out in California. And so me thinking like, because I do the search parties on the res. And I usually just have to make a post and I'll get a tip on where somebody is, you know. And and we really, we have a lot of families to find their loved ones. So I thought, well, I'm going to go out to LA and I'm going to go find my sister. Oh, uh, I had like, yeah, I was kind of like in shock. It's like a whole new ball game in the cities. Everyone's so disconnected. Like you have to drive two hours from one little city to the next little city, and yeah, it was it was really exhausting. But I got to you know, I owe her missing persons and get her in the database and and all of that, and so like. At the same time, I was helping another family look for their their loved one, you know, and and um, it's just like the work continues. Even when I'm not working, I'm still working. <laughs> but I like it because you know I know that that one day when I go to the next realm, people are gonna say I'm I was a good ancestor. <laughs> That's my goal. <laughs> 
Thank you, thank you so much, Mama Jules. Uh, I just, I want to send you some some of this Louisiana warmth, so that you you're not too cold up there. And I hope that you you stick with around with us. Uh, thank you so much for your th thank you so much for your your words and, and your and your love that you share for your community. Um, and we'll be definitely be coming back to you during uh, the Q and A. So um, I'm not I'm not gonna go ahead. Oh, what, what, I was down in your territory at the um Louis Levy camp. Oh yeah. Yeah, that we had Cherie. Cherie. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, we had Cherie on the on got, the last yeah. session. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. She's badass. She is. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you to catch uh, so Big Win, Big Win is a, a, a two-spirit uh, member of uh, Northern Arapaho tribe uh, from the Wind River Reservation. Uh, at a young age, uh, Big Win recognized many injustices and degrees of oppression within their community. They became involved in youth and climate leadership at the age of 13, uh, when they learned of environmental racism happening uh, near their home. Since then, uh, they have worked on numerous campaigns throughout Indian country, from Standing Rock uh, to Otis State Forest to Enbridge's uh, Line 3, and is currently uh, the Organizing and Communications Associate uh, for the Indigenous Land Alliance of Wyoming. So Big Wind, uh, welcome. I give you the floor. Uh, thank you. First of all, I'd just like to introduce myself in here on the eighteenth, our sacred language. Hello, relatives. It's good to see you all here today. My rap home name is Wind River. I'm a two spirit member of the my community, and I am from the Wind River Reservation in Central Wyoming. Um, as a kid. I grew up in um, on the south side of the Wind River, and um, I think like many of the stories that have been shared here tonight, um, we have dealt with uh, environmental racism, and a lot of us didn't have the language for it back then. Um, the housing projects that I grew up with, or grew up around, were uh, right behind them were oil fields, gas fields, and they were using the creeks and the rivers that we played in um, as dilution for the uh, for the extraction of these uh, uh, fossil fuels. And so we didn't know it, nobody was telling us, but those uh, rivers and creeks were tainted. You know, growing up, we were fishing in them and swimming in them. And that has um, completely impacted my life and my life's work and, and um, since I was 13 years old, have been an organizer in my community um, against uh, environmental issues that are going on. And um, uh, five years ago, I ventured out to Standing Rock, um, and that put me on the path that I am now as a water protector who's in the water protector movement. Um, you know, you all heard from Mama Jules last night. Uh, I mean, tonight, and this is um, someone that I really look up to in our community. That was the first uh, indigenous person that I ever seen locked down to a machine. And she just did it with so much grace. She was um, telling people that they could take action into their own hands. And as a person who comes from a very, very conservative community, we rely a lot on um, the long game. And so people try to pass laws, people try to go to the courts, people try to have litigation. Um, oftentimes it's uh, really, really slow and it never really gets us anywhere. And oftentimes it bites us um, in the butt. You know, um, the longest sitting court case in Wyoming was about the water rights, who controls the water um, on the Wind River Reservation where I'm from. And the state decided that um, they do. Um, and the federal, the federal government upheld that decision. And so now uh, we're, we're wanting to do things other than just litigation, than other than just 
relying solely on their systems because oftentimes these systems were not designed for our participation or our protection. And it, it, I feel like it's my responsibility as an indigenous person and two-spirit person in my community. Um, that's one of our roles. Um, traditionally, you would involve uh, two-spirit people um, when you were in battle because they had an expanded horizon. Um, in the Arapaho language, the word for it is hahach, and it means hollow bone, and it means essentially that you're able to inhabit a masculine or feminine energy. And um, we were, we are um, baby namers and song makers. And um, anytime that there was a disagreement or um, a battle or something like that, we would be called as an advisory role. And I feel like I'm fulfilling that role to this day. Um, Standing Rock changed my life. I, after that, uh, went to Massachusetts and there was a, another project that was happening literally back to back. Um, and so when I left uh, Standing Rock in 2017, when we were forcibly removed after being there for several months, um, I headed over to Massachusetts. And uh, like I was explaining to a couple of panelists earlier, um, I plan on being there for two weeks. I went there for a spa job and then I started asking questions um, to find out that they were building this pipeline through indigenous stonescapes. And these stonescapes were tens and thousands of years old. Um, and some of them, like they were, the rocks were imported. They were from thousands of miles away. They were in the shapes of certain animals. And a lot of them were aligned with the stars. Nobody knows the songs that were sang. Nobody knows that the ceremonies that were done. Um, but this pipeline, um, just bulldozed them and was going to lay this pipeline um, through this uh, really old growth forest in Massachusetts. And so um, was out there for several months as well in 2017, um, really trying to stop the work that was happening in Order State Forest that was being um, put on by Kinder Morgan at that time, um, and financed by Kinder Morgan. And so um, in the late 2017, they finished that pipeline. I ended up heading back to Standing Rock to um, go try to deal with my cases that were I was dealing with out there. And um, I was acquitted at trial. And when I was acquitted at trial, a person walked up to me and said, hey, do you want to come to line three? And I said, yeah, I'm down. And I packed all my stuff up and I went to Northern Minnesota. And this was in the summer of 2018. And so, you know, as a person who's been on the front lines um, of fossil fuel expansion for the last five years, um, and I spent, you know, three years up in Minnesota, um, I think it's no more business as usual. Um, right now, a lot of these corporations are trying to get in the very last bits of a, of a dying field and they will do anything it takes. They will buy out our governments, even our tribal governments. They'll pay us off, even they'll pay off our tribal people. They will hire us. They will do whatever it takes to allow these things to keep happening in our communities. And um, as like a person who's named after a river, I feel a responsibility to be uh, a vocal cord for that um, body. And I know that, uh, Indigenous people, because we are the land protecting itself, therefore we are the vocal cords of the land itself. Um, and oftentimes we are stuck in situations where non-natives don't understand that connection and are so disconnected that they don't understand the violence that they're perpetrating you know, in these communities being a cog in this wheel. Um, but the front lines dramatically changed my life and I am constantly learning from mentors on how to do different things and what different tactics work in different fields. And I never go into a community thinking that I know what's best for that community. I go in there with a compassion and an open mind and I fight within the perimeter that they want me to fight within, the container they want me to fight within. I ask them you know, how I can help and how I can utilize the skills that I have to be able to um, help them win their campaign. And I want to be there, not when 
things are just uh, when they're just building the line, because oftentimes it's already too late. And I think that that was a lot of the things that we were feeling over at line three. Um, we were out there for years um, and we went to every single part of the process. You know, I went to the PUC hearings. I went to the regulatory commissions. I, you know, we all wrote our legislators and everything and nothing worked. And I can tell you at the end of the day, um, the only thing that worked in the line three campaign was direct action. People chaining themselves to the machines, people chaining themselves to the pipe, crawling inside the pipe and, and staying in there because they knew that that pipe couldn't be utilized on the front lines if, or on, as a pipeline if there was somebody inside of there. People were up in trees, in tree sits, um, even in the winter. And, you know, people lived there in sub freezing degree temperatures all throughout, you know, multiple winters to try to protect something that's really, really important to Dakota and Anishinaabe people, which is wild rice. Um, over the last five years, I've been arrested 10 times in order to try to stop um, projects that are affecting, uh, that have negative repercussions for our environment. And I know that um, I will continue to do that. And I believe in a diversity of tactics. I believe that, it, you know, you don't have to be the one that's getting arrested to be able to even be on the front lines. There are a lot of different roles that it takes to be able to upkeep a community to, so that people can be able to take active um, roles. And a lot of these situations wouldn't be possible if it weren't for camps. Um, and I know that there is a resurgence of indigenous led camps that are happening all over um, Turtle Island and all over the world where people are um, reconnecting with the land and you know, reclaiming those parts of themselves again. And if you're wondering you know, how you can help indigenous peoples who are fighting on the front lines, um, like Mama Jules was saying, there's a water fight within a hundred miles of everybody. And I think the only way that we're gonna be able to win something like this is by us being able to not only show up in a sense of urgency when a community is going through something similar as we're going through, but that we create a network of water protectors who are fighting on every square inch of this earth so that we know that it's being taken care of in that way um, and that we're not having to travel long distances because people are educated enough to know that um, when we hurt the earth, then we hurt ourselves. And um, when, you know, I think it was, it's pretty telling really recently, I um, mean, really close to Earth Week, how scientists have been locking themselves, you know, follow the hashtag scientist rebellion on Instagram or Facebook, and scientists have been locking themselves to banks. Um, they're not blaming uh, us as individuals. They're not blaming humans for uh, the climate crisis. They're blaming the corporations who are responsible and the banks who are financing these projects. And so I think that we need to really recognize that, yes, we can make some very uh, changes to our life patterns, but that won't be nearly enough unless we stop these banks and these corporations from doing the destruction. And I really thank you for being able to listen to me today. Uh, big wins. Uh, thank you so much. Um, we're going to do um, a quick um, a quick question. Uh, we have uh, one more panelist that will be joining us momentarily, but we definitely want to uh, take a uh, take a second uh, to talk uh, to talk through at least uh, one question. Uh, thinking about uh, going back to uh, Justine's uh, presentation, um, thinking about uh, thinking about the Green New Deal. Um, in in what way does it not go far enough? And and. You know, I also want to uh, just open it up uh, as well to to Mama Jules and and to Big Wind, uh, not just about uh, not just about the Green New Deal, but then 
um, systems altogether, uh, whether they are uh, the federal government or even our own tribal governments, uh, how, are, uh, how are ways in which uh, current systems are not going far enough to support the work uh, that the front lines uh, is committed to? So Thank we'll go you. to Justin, yeah. yeah, first. Yeah, so, um, well, the Green New Deal is uh, completely invested in the United States and the idea of the United States. Um, ultimately, we take a um, like non-liberal approach to how we want to create change, which is revolutionary change. You know, we um, we are completely um, not invested in U.S. imperialism on any level, and the Green New Deal. Um, sorry, I'm trying to look in in the book itself. I know we said I know we talk about uh, the Green New Deal a little. Um, here we go. I know we talk about the Green New Deal a little bit. Um, and I'll just read the first paragraph, the Green New Deal, which looks and sounds like eco-socialism, offers a real chance at galvanizing popular support for both, while anti-capitalist in spirit and paying lip service for to decolonization, it must go further, and so too must the movements that support it. And so basically, um, we're just saying that the Green New Deal isn't enough, and um, we actually need an indigenous-centered um, action plan, climate action plan, to achieve um, decolonization, not just decolonization, but achieving a, um, a sustainable world. Thank you. And, and, and um, Mama Jules, Big One, do you have any, uh, any thoughts to add about uh, uh, system change, just current system change? I guess um, I think like the question you asked is how is like our government not supportive? You know, it's like, I'm the only program on Pine Ridge that fights meth. I'm grassroots. I'm not even part of the tribe. The tribe has gotten millions of dollars. At one of the, um, the last administration uh, did a state of emergency after we had like all these murders and they got so much money. There's still not a tribal program that fights meth. They're like, oh, we'll just let her do it. And and you know they they're not supportive at all and so like ever since i had this dream of getting my land i like asked the tribe like you know i asked them several times for support and i just they they just don't support me but that's fine because like we're still here and we're still doing the work and we're still going to build on this land and we're still going to have a safe place for the kids. We're going to have a safe place for the addicts to be able to heal. We're going to have sweat lodges. You know, we'll have elders come out. We're going to plant gardens for the community. You know, just we're going to we're going to keep folks busy. My brother gave us a horse. You know, the horse is our medicine. Just being around them in our culture. You know, they, they provide medicine for our mental, our mental health. And so my approach to like the healing is, you know, going back to, to our spirituality, going back to the land. <clears throat> Sorry, going back to learning how to live off the land. You know, like really decolonizing, like heck with electricity. Why are we paying a $300 electricity bill during the winter month on the reservation? You know, whereas in the city, you'd only be paying 40 bucks. So there's still that, that really horrible unbalance that, that we face on the reservations. And it would be great if if the government, like our even just our tribal government, would support the frontline, the frontliners, 
the ones, you know, like, oh, you need to go to the front line. You know, how can we help you? How can we support you? I just seen Cheyenne River honored um, Jocelyn and Oscar, which I thought was really beautiful. Really, really beautiful because they deserve that honoring. You know, they they fought hard against KXL. And so I thought that was really beautiful. Thank you. Um, just, uh, we have like a, we have a few seconds before we need to uh, bring Camille and Big One. Do you have uh, any, any quick thoughts? Can we bring Camille in first? Because uh, she is our fourth panelist. So, you know, thank you. So I'm super excited to be introducing Camille Madison, who's a citizen of my tribe, the Wampanoag tribe of Gay Hedequina. Um, she's a keeper and teacher of tribal language and currently teaches at the Wampanoag Language Reclamation Project's We To Move School, along with other community classes. Camille is also an activist and advocate for Aboriginal rights and other tribal and climate issues. So welcome, Camille. Um, thank you all um, for being here and allowing me to be here and hold space tonight um, for all of the issues that um, we as Indigenous people um, have to face and um, respond to. And it's so important um, that we're able to hold these spaces um, to uplift one another's causes and to support each other. Solidarity is such a great thing. Um, but I was asked to speak today just specifically around um, some of the issues that are happening here in Massachusetts. Um, and one of the um, issues that I've just um, started to get involved with um, was in regards to the Pine Barrens here in Massachusetts. There's a large area um, all throughout uh, the, the coast of Massachusetts that holds um, you know, uh, just the unique um, area um, to this area, basically. Um, and there are uh, big money um, industries who are basically using these pine barrens, um, clearing them out, um, and then stripping um, the sand um, for silica. Um, and with that, we find that um, they're destroying our homelands um, and they're um, interrupting and um, causing, you know, um, destruction with the animals um, and the life that um, the plant life also unique to this area. Um, they're causing destruction there. Um, and so one of the um, lead people on this, um, on this, uh, you know, movement is um, a lawyer by the name of Meg Sheehan. Um, I had the opportunity to sit with her and talk with her about her work that she's doing. Um, and one of the things that she let me know is not only is this, you know, a unique um, area, the Pine Barrens, but also they protect a large aquifer underneath uh, the Pine Barrens um, and the companies who are stripping the land are um, doing it illegally. Um, and so what can we do to, um, you know, my question to her was what can we do to kind of spread awareness on, you know, this issue and um, the land itself is supposed to be used for residential and cranberry bogs and they are not using it um, with those intentions and purposes. They are literally just clearing, straight clearing the trees, chopping them down, and then um, digging deep for sand, mining. Um, and um, yeah, I wanted to um, basically just start with our young people um, to kind of give them this information and allow them the space to brainstorm as to how um, they could, you know, potentially help spread the message and spread awareness. Um, and this is so important um, because our pine barrens, we know uh, we, some of our creation stories come from pine trees. Um, our creation story is, you know, from pine trees. And so um, we want to protect 
our homelands. We want to make sure that the, the animals and the aquatic life and the plant life that live in these areas are safe and free from harm and free from, you know, the development of, you know, these millionaires, billionaires um, who basically just get paid to destroy um, those areas. And one of the things that we're seeing um, is that it's mainly happening on the mainland right now in areas of Plymouth, Massachusetts, Carver, Wareham, and those areas. Um, and we want to prevent that from spreading. Um, and so we want to just raise the awareness of how they're moving in these illegal ways um, and no one's stopping them. Um, and people are fighting hard um, just to try to protect what's left of these pine barrens, but they're even, you know, clearing the land and after they strip the sand, they're also putting, you know, these, um, um, what are they called? The green, the, the solar panels, um, placing solar panels all throughout these areas where they've clear cut. Um, and so that in itself is also problematic. Um, I'm not sure why people think that, um, yes, thank you for that. The link is savethepinebarrens.org um, to learn more. There's plenty of information there, um, but it's something that we definitely need to uplift. And um, we want to make sure that folks understand that in all of all across Indian country, all across the lands, that there are sacred areas and areas that we really need to protect because they are a large part of our source of water um, and sustenance. Um, and so we want to make sure that these plants and these animals are able to thrive in these areas um, for generations to come. Um, so thank you for that. Appreciate the time. Thank you so much, Camille. Um, we're going to move into Q&A now. Um, I want to circle back to the question uh, for Big Wind and I think also Camille. Um, the question was related to the Green New Deal, but more specifically, um, how has the US government failed environmentally? Um, sort of all that kind of stuff. I was really struck by Camille saying uh, that they're putting solar panels on the Pine Barrens, which is very much you know like a green solution by causing even more environmental devastation, which is just a very interesting metaphor. So Big Wind and then Camille. Yeah, thank you for bringing up this very important question. Problems that I have with the Green New Deal is that um, it would require us to um, transform our energy system to green energy. And the problems with green energy that I have is that it requires raw materials of lithium, cobalt, copper, platinum, and all these other necessary metals to be able to create wind panels, um, batteries, windmills. Um, you know, oftentimes, you know, like we were, um, the fellow speaker was just saying beforehand, it has an environmental impact. Um, not to mention uh, its own carbon footprint to be able to uh, produce this amount. And, you know, I will go back to say that we're not going to be able to uh, solar panel or wind turbine our way out of this climate crisis. And in fact, we're living too large. Um, we're going to need to think about uh, the sacrifices that we need to make for future generations. And that requires all of us using less energy, not just transforming our energy system. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I would also, I mean, just a matter of my opinion is to say that a lot of these green solutions are not green at all. Um, and, you know, you heard, I'm sorry, I don't know um, their name, Big Wind, um, just saying, you know, the lithium, you know, and all these different metals that they're, this is not, this is not green. Um, and it's important for us to put that out there, um, that these are actually harmful to the communities that they're, these large batteries, lithium batteries are being placed in there. It's just causing more destruction and reaping more havoc on the, all of us, you know, not just the human race, but, you know, all of our relatives. And I think it's important for us to uplift that, 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 um, that, that message. Thank you so much. So we're gonna move on into the full Q and A. So please either drop your questions in the Q and A or else 
in the chat or you can also direct message me if you would prefer. Um, I'm going to start off with a question that was direct message to me. Um, it's about the national parks. The national parks are often presented as quote unquote pristine wilderness and um, environmentally friendly and all sorts of things, um, which completely ignores obviously the cost um, on indigenous people um, and sort of just conservation efforts in general by white people tend to be very misguided and misplaced. I know that for us on uh, Martha's Vineyard, um, Jackie Kennedy Onassis uh, left her entire property to uh, a white conservation group instead of our tribe. Um, so sort of very misplaced there. So the question is, what are your thoughts on the national parks? Um, do you want the national parks returned to tribes? Like what should be done with them? Um, does anyone want to start? I can um, just give a quick couple of quick few thoughts. So like our national, first of all, like our national parks and public lands were like a, a way to keep um, un, unoccupied lands away from indigenous jurisdiction. Um, but because of that, it's also, I feel like allows a like, um, like an easy route to land back. You know, like when I imagine land back, I imagine public lands and national parks as the first bits of land to actually be returned to tribes. Anyone else on this question? I can go really quick. Um, the first national park uh, was designated here in my home territory, and it was actually the 150th anniversary on March 1st of the creation of the Yellowstone National Park. And, um, you know, a lot of the white people were celebrating at first until they started inviting um, the uh, 49 indigenous nations to the table that have an affinity with this land. And they found out that a lot of people have different stories. This type of model, it's known as fortress conservation or um, the North American model for conservation, wildlife conservation. And it has been replicated all over the earth. And currently right now, as we speak, is killing indigenous people in Africa and in Asia. Um, and a lot of these places are funded by the WWF, you know, and a lot of people know them by their sign, that the big panda bear. Um, and that's one of the largest conservation organizations in the world. And they are taking land from indigenous people, putting a fence around it. And not only does that disrupt those species, but it disrupts the migration patterns of indigenous people, of not only indigenous people, but the species who live in those areas. And for me, um, we need to look past the North American model of conservation. We need to come up with alternative solutions. And a lot of the um, consensus with indigenous peoples is, yeah, giving um, public lands and uh, parks back. That was a way of taking them away from indigenous people um, by having these designations. One of the hardest situations with this is that they see wilderness is untouched by man. And that's a fallacy in itself. A lot of these areas were stewarded by indigenous people for tens and thousands of years. So in fact, it wasn't untouched by man. Um, they were stewarded by us. Those are excellent points. Would anyone else like to jump in or uh, if not, I'm gonna move on to a question Diane asked in the chat, um, asking, can you address the dumping of the 1 million gallons of radioactive water into Cape Cod Bay? Um, Camille, obviously I'm gonna kick this one to you, but I think it also applies to many other tribes who have had like radioactive stuff on their lands, but I'm gonna kick it to Camille first. Yeah, my apologies. I, I haven't gotten too involved in what's going on there in Plymouth. Um, in Cape Cod Bay, I know that um, there has been some standouts um, just to kind of protest the dumping that's been happening there. But I think that, um, like you just said, Keisha, like there's been a lot of this happening for such a long time. And I keep referring this, and I don't know why, but I keep referring to this as, um, you know, just the, there, there was a show recently on, um, I think it was Hulu, like little fires everywhere. There's so much happening right now that it's hard. It's just hard to keep 
you know, you know, just in touch with all of the issues that we're facing. And there's only but so many few of us that are, you know, here doing the doing that work. Um, but I know that, you know, there's been a lot of different challenges with dumping. There's been a lot of different challenges with, you know, fishermen out on the waters and being, you know, followed by EPOs um, and being harassed by EPOs, you know, being, you know, told to, to, to basically, you know, give up their, their catch, you know, whatever it is that they, that they've caught for the day. Um, but there's just a lot of issues happening on, on Cape Cod, um, in general, you know, with the, with the sound and wind, um, folks, people to all the, the wind turbines and how that affects aquatic life of, there's just so much. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't have a lot to say about, um, what's happening there in, uh, Plymouth. Um, but I know that, their issues, you know, and that they do have to be addressed and they do have to be, you know, uplifted. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, it's, it's really disturbing what's happening on Cape Cod in general. Um, does anyone else have any comments maybe on radioactivity in general, or I think it really links into the um, U.S. military industrial complex in general in terms of just large scale pollution of the earth. I know we've been reading a lot about um, Hawaii and how the US Navy has literally made the water in Hawaii undrinkable. Um, so I think it's all very interrelated. So would anyone like to speak to that? Um, I will. On, on my territory, they um, use the northern part, northwest part of our territory in the red shirt community as a bombing range. And we were just talking about that today because they're still finding the warheads out there. And because of the uranium mine, their sole water source, which is the Cheyenne River, is radioactive. That, that whole river is, nobody can use it anymore because of, of the uranium and probably the coal mine and, and also with the the bombing range and they literally kick people off their land to build that and relocated them and that was just another form of genocide thank you would anyone else like to speak on it no Okay. Um, I think we have time for one more question and then we're gonna wrap up. Um, the last question is, um, tell us about one current struggle. If people go away from this webinar with one current struggle that they need to look up and support, what is that current struggle? Um, let's start with uh, Big Wind. Hey, I'm sorry, can you repeat that question? Yeah, no problem. That was my fault. I should have made sure that you were on. Um, I asked if there's one struggle um, that people should go away and look up and support. Um, what would that struggle be for you and why? So currently, um, as I was uh, in my introduction, I am um, a part of the Indigenous Land Alliance of Wyoming. And one of the projects that we're working on right now is um, to protect the red desert um the the red desert is in wyoming and is the largest contiguous piece of land in the lower 48 and it has a lot of indigenous sacred sites and a lot of those sacred sites um including petroglyphs are being vandalized and so um we're asking for um creating not only protections for these sacred sites but um trying to get indigenous rights uh, and stewardship rights added to those protections. And this isn't the first place that it's been done. Um, we're following what's happened out at Bears Ears um, very closely and also following um, language that the Washoe people have done over by Lake Tahoe. And so by um, providing those things, I think we can show that um, we can protect this piece of land and even though it's a very conservative country, um, 
that we can find common ground to be able to allow indigenous or traditional ecological knowledge to be implemented inside of these plans. Thank you. Uh, the, to answer the question in the chat, what is this place called? Uh, the Red Desert, correct? Uh, let's go to Camille next, please. Um, again, I just would, I would, you know, just talk about, you know, the, the homelands here, um, um, the Pine Barrens and, you know, our waters. And I honestly, um, just recently I, I came from a, um, a conference on the rights of nature and just realizing that, you know, we as indigenous people, we're stewards, but we're also advocates, you know, for, um, these sacred spaces. And I think that it's important for folks to know that nature has their own rights. You know, they, 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 they can't speak for, for themselves. Um, and so we as indigenous people, that's our job, you know, here, you know, in relation to all of these places, these hills that are being cut down by 20 feet. And, you know, um, it's our job to speak out for them because um, they carry the bones of a lot of our ancestors and um we want to maintain those spaces and make sure that they're kept in a good way um and so we want to just make sure that they're preserved um like i said for future generations and beyond thank you camille and please uh look up the pine barrens um in your own time it's very upsetting especially because i'm quinna um Mama Jules, what is one issue that you would like or struggle that you would like people to learn more about? Well, of course, I'm going to say Mothers Against Meth Alliance, you know, because we are grassroots. We've been grassroots and, you know, we, we do go to other territories. We start at Mama's and several other Indigenous territories. And, um, you know, we've, we've had this dream of building up like this land and now, you know, I got the land it, and, you know, it's finally coming true and it's going to be the very first grassroots indigenous meth healing. I don't know if I want to call it a camp, um, meth healing space in all of Turtle Island. Like this would be the very first one ever. So you know, it's been my dream for a long time and I just been praying about it and praying about it. And, you know, now's the time. Now's the time to build for my people and help my people to start to heal and help them to learn how to help the land to heal. Thank you so much. It's such an important struggle. And, you know, you did such a beautiful job explaining how the substance abuse issues are so intimately tied to environmental struggles. Um, last but certainly not least, uh, Justine, what is one struggle that you hope people will learn more about? Um, I'm going to go ahead and go with border town violence. Um, right now, uh, a lot of our work in the Red Nation, or one of the my current projects in the Red Nation is book events next week for this new book by David Correa, The Ford is by Dr. Melanie Yazi, and it's called An Enemy Such As This, Larry Casus in the Fight for Native Liberation and One Family on Two Continents Over Three Centuries. And um, a lot of like the core and heart of our work comes from the legacy of Larry Casus, whose mission was so simple. Um, all it, and and it's that same like that like simple want and love that you have for your people that is what what transpires into like our revolutionary movements. Larry Casus simply wanted his his people to not die on the side of the road from uh, from exposure from alcoholism, and um, and he was murdered for that. He talks about um, he talks about you know the United States and occupation. They brought disease, raped our women, killed our brothers, the animals, murdered our elders, leveled out vast forests, polluted our rivers, filled our air with chemicals, called us savage, pagans, Indians. Never before had we seen an enemy such as this. And um, really, what that speaks to is. Um, an enemy such as this, I think of it as U.S. occupation, and um, 
resistance to border town violence, wanting those simple things for your people to live and thrive and to be safe and to not be murdered is like the core of the red deal. Uh, because ultimately to, um, to combat border town violence, we're combating occupation. And in the red deal, that's the first part is end the occupation. And so in border towns where indigenous people are heavily policed, where we die from exposure, from lack of shelter, lack of food, lack of, um, lack of all these resources, um, I see an end to border town violence. End to board, and I see an end to border town violence as the means to ending the occupation. And um, it starts with our most vulnerable, most marginalized people, and that's indigenous people in border towns. Um, and yeah, learn about it. Um, there's the Red Nation Rising. We talk about it in the Red Deal, and now an enemy such as this um, are three books that you can get into to begin to learn about border town violence. It's a fairly new term. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Justine. And um, thank you so much also for just generally bringing up um, the importance of listening to indigenous people from the global south in general and from the southern part of the United States. Um, we're going to wrap up now. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Raquel Halsey. I just want to say thank you so much to all of our panelists and um, everyone who came from United American Indians of New England. Um, Raquel. Thank you. Um, that was a really incredible talk. Big wind, Justine, Camille, Mama Jules, you guys are all um, doing it. And um, your, your leaders, your examples for um, not only indigenous people, but for, for all of our relations on this, on this earth to learn how to understand the land that they're on, to learn how to care for the land, the water, each other, our families, our, you know, our communities. Um, so I, you know, there, I know that there were a lot of questions in the chat. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them. We're, we're always sad that, you know, we're tight on time, but um, I just want to thank all of our viewers as well. And please uh, stay tuned to our Facebook pages they, and our uh, website uh, to sign up for additional uh, webinars that we're going to be doing. We're, gonna, we're doing this all year long. Earth Day, you know, means nothing to us. <laughs> we, we, we do the work every day um, because, because it, you know, it, it, means, it means our health. It means our, you know, the health of our communities and our loved ones. So uh, thank you all so much. Have a wonderful night. I'm going to close out. Thank you. Thank you.